morning right now. So this is uh, quite a book, quite a, a history book, quite a prophecy book, and quite a doctrinal book also. Remember Lee Kutstra and all of those that are on mission trip today, uh, and uh, Linda Glass and her family are not here. She, uh, she, she finally, after about three, three different times in the, that they went inside of her heart to try to open her heart up, they finally got it done. So praise the Lord for that. That finally, uh, they finally got it done. And, uh, and she's uh, recovering at home right now. It's good to have you all here today. Uh, Brother Jason, would you mind coming up here and leading us in prayer? <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you for this time we get to be together as believers in Christ, Lord, and I just pray that you would help us to open up our minds and just to soak up what you have to say to us today. Through Dr. Phillips, Lord, and I just pray that you would uh, be with those missionaries that are away and serving you, Lord, and I just pray that you would open up the doors and in hearts of those that they're, they're ministering, ministering to, Lord, and I just pray that you would be with those that aren't here today that couldn't make it and that you would uh, heal them up and bring them back, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> We're studying a lot about Revelation. The book of Revelation is a, one of the most contested books that's ever been written. The Apostle Paul wrote that while he was on, or not the Apostle Paul, but the Apostle John wrote that when he was in exile from one of the ten periods of persecution that we're going to talk about today under the ten Roman Caesars. Uh, and we're going to talk about their lies. Uh, we studied Ephesus, that the, the church age calls Ephesus last week. All right. And uh, the, the, what does the word Ephesus mean? What does the word Ephesus mean? Relaxed. All right. At that period of time, they were relaxed. The church did have persecution. The church is. When I say the word church, I, I don't really like that term because we're talking about local, visible, physical bodies of believers in different areas. We're not talking about church uh, generically, so to speak. Uh, so each one of these were churches in some area, okay, that, that believe. From uh, basically 30 A.D., that was a church of Ephesus, from 30 A.D. all the way to 251 A.D., that's the period of time, 30 or 31 A.D., when the Lord called that church out. The church was in existence before the day of Pentecost, as we have studied many, many times. It was already in existence, period, okay? It had already done some evangelizing. The apostles were already set in it. It had the gifts set placed in the church. They even had a church treasure, which was, who was it? Judas. Judas. All right. What's the proper pronunciation of Judas's name? Judah. Judah. Judah, which means what? Praise Jehovah. He had a good name. He just didn't do very good with it. All right. Well, at that period of time, we studied some of the things that we're studying in church history. And how many of you have your charts? If you don't have a chart, Brother Bill, could you get these charts out, please? They're right up there on the right hand side. I want you to have one of these church history charts. Yeah, yeah, the trail of blood chart. You need these charts, all right? If you don't have one, please get one. All right, we're going to see the things that happened during these period of times. The doctrinal evolution that was taking place, all right? And we studied Ephesus, and then we're going to go over to Smyrna. That's where we're starting actually today, but we've got to review just a little bit, all right? Now, the periods of, of Roman persecution actually began here. The greatest persecutor of God's churches in the very beginning was who? Who was the greatest persecutor of God's churches in the beginning? Huh? The Jews persecuted them. From right from the very beginning. And we have in the book of Acts, we have that. All right? Who was one of the first martyrs? Stephen, in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts. All right. Jesus organized his church during his ministry. All right. Uh, during that period of time, we have Christians going in as far as England, as England, Britain, the British Isles. 
We have, have them going into Scotland, Ireland. Who was, a mission, who was a Baptist missionary to Ireland? St. Patrick. Patrick. The Catholics, uh, the, the, the Catholics did not like Patrick in Ireland. I want you to understand that. Patrick baptized by his own hands over 100,000 people in converse in Ireland. He was an English boy, or what we call a British boy. He, his father was a deacon in a Baptist church in England, which was basically sent out from the Apostle Paul, Putins and Claudia. Okay, there's the ones that went over there in that area. And uh, his, that, that church that Patrick was in, he was captured as a, um, well, the Irish were pretty much cannibals, pretty much. They eat, eat, eat their enemies' hearts and all like and their livers and stuff. I mean, these people were something else. These Irish were. And they also captured and they used people as slaves. Anyway, he was taken into Ireland and he was a, a slave for several years. He escaped and went back to Britain and went back to the church where his father was a deacon. And he got a, a great calling of God to go back as a missionary. And he went back, and uh, the Catholic Church was just beginning to try to control. This is what we call the Nicolaitans. Remember that last week we said, and, and he told the church at Ephesus, I, I, I agree with you, you hate the, the, uh, the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. That's the people rulers. Okay? Nico means rule, and Laos means people Nicolaitans. And uh, anyway, he said, you hate their deeds. The Catholic Church started this. This is where it started telling who could preach here and who could preach there. But it hadn't become the Catholic Church yet. It was just evolving into that evil thing. Okay? Patrick went into Ireland. He established 365 churches. He established seminaries. The, the uh, Catholic Church said he established monasteries and celibacy, hogwash. What year was celibacy initiated? 1123. That's a long time after Patrick. Patrick had nothing to do with celibacy. All right, But he did establish 365 churches. He established deacons and pastors in each one because he was sent out as a missionary from the church in England where he lived. All right? And when you study St. Patrick's Day and all this kind of stuff and all drinking this green beer and all that kind of junk, he had nothing to do with any of that. The Catholic Church, what would become the Catholic Church out of Rome, fought him all the time that he was in England. And they said, you have no authority here. And he said, I have church authority from my church. I don't need yours. Period. I have nothing to you. Later on, because he did such great deeds in Ireland, they decided to make him a saint. But he never had anything to do with the Catholic Church at all. Period. Zip. Nothing. <clears throat> And if you look in the Catholic encyclopedias and you study Patrick, they said he was a primitive Christian. He wasn't like the Ca Catholics did later. What were all primitive Christians? Baptist. <laughs> all right, in doctrine and practice. All right, so we got there. Have we studied Ephesus? Now let's go over to the book of Revelation in the second chapter of the book of Re Revelation. <clears throat> and we're starting with verse number... Eight. And it says to the angel, to the angelos of the ecclesia of Smyrna. All right. To the angel. All right. Who is the angel of the, who did the Bible say the angels were? Pastors. So this is the pastor, the leadership of the churches in the age of Smyrna. Smyrna means suffering. Suffering or persecution. It means to beat down. All right. During this time, period of time, the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ were beat down. Okay? They were beat down. Now, I want you to understand that some of this applies even to the Ephesus age, all the way back, some of the persecution. The uh, Rome, originally, under Pontius Pilate, who knows who Pontius Pilate was? That was a believer in Rome. <laughs> Basically, I, I'm not in Rome, but in Jerusalem. The one that 
They declared that Jesus was was uh, was guiltless five times, that he was innocent five times, that did his best to try to release him. He even gave him a scoundrel, a Sakari, a murderer, by the name of Barabbas. What does Barabbas mean? What does Barabbas mean? Barabbas. Barabbas. What does it mean, brother? Son of the Father. Son of the Father. And, of course, his father was not God. Okay? But he was released. Okay? He was released. And Pontius Pilate did everything he could to help the Christians. He allowed Jesus to preach during his whole ministry. He allowed him to do that. If you read Pontius Pilate's letter, by the way, a lot of people don't, don't believe Pontius Pilate's letter, but if you realize that Pontius Pilate's letter was quoted in all of the early church history times by Eusebius and all of those, okay? So I think it's very valid. All right, 2 and verse 8. And to the angel of the church of Smyrna write the first and the last who was dead and has come to life, the one who became dead. Now, John 1 and 1, as we look at that, we know what John 1 and 1 says. You, have you got that one down, Chris? John 1 and 1, in beginning, kept on being the Word. The Word there is actually should be translated Jehovah because that's the word in Hebrew, Hathavar, which they never spoke of the word Jehovah. They never said the word Jehovah. After Israel received the law of God, they never spoke the name of God again. We don't know how to say that personal name of God. We do not know how to pronounce that. That is a name. We don't know how to say it. They either call it Hadabar or Hashem, and now the Jews say Adonai because they will not pronounce that name. They're afraid to pronounce it because it's so holy. That is the personal name of God. In, yeah. in the New Testament, John, when he wrote the Gospel of John, and here we have another one of his writings here in the book of Revelation. This is the same John. Okay, John wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. Okay, The book of Revelation is so full of Hebraisms that many of the so-called Greek Scholars will not accept it because it's got too many grammatical mistakes in Greek. But it's Hebrew, Hebraisms. And the one great Hebraism that he used that many people miss, in beginning, in R.K. Ain Hologos, in beginning, kept on being the Jehovah. And that word in R.K. there is different than it says in beginnings in the book of Genesis. A lot of people take Genesis 1 and 1 and John 1 and 1 and say these are alike. But John 1 and 1 goes way back further in time on that chart, way back there in eternity before God ever created anything. That's when that John 1 and 1 existed. Genesis 1 and 1, it says, Bara sheath, bara, Elohim eth hashemayim without It says, in beginnings, God created, in one of the beginnings, God created the heavens and the earth. That's physical. We're talking about before anything physical was ever created. This is way back yonder. Way, way back there. Okay? And so the word Jehovah there, our logos, means the word Jehovah. In beginning kept on being Jehovah. Because Jehovah kept on being an inseparable part of Godhead. A lot of theologians say, well, Jesus wasn't God when he was on the cross of Calvary. Baloney. He was always God and he was always man. He was related to us. The whole book of Ruth is written to show us how God would become related to us and redeem us from our sins. He's the only redeemer there ever was. He's the only way you're ever going to get to heaven, period. Okay? John 1.14 in Greek, what does it say? Anybody know? How do you pronounce that in Greek? What do you, how do you say that in Greek? John 1.14, beginning. Kai, Hologos, Sarks, Agenitol. And the Jehovah flesh, that's carne in Spanish, and in Latin, the Jehovah flesh, he became and dwelt among us. That's the fulfillment of the Jehovah title. Now in the book of Revelation, he keeps talking about the word, the first and the last and all that. The eternal one is what he's saying. He is the, the Alpha and the Omega and the Aleph and the Tau. 
All right? The first and the last. In Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible it says that, and now we have John using another Hebrewism here in the book of Revelation. That's what the first and the last business is. <coughs> right, the first and the last, the Aleph and the Tau, the Alpha and the Omega, who became dead. God became dead on the cross of Calvary. I didn't say God went out of existence, but the physical Built, the physical body of Jesus became dead and he was God. But he didn't stay dead, did he? Because Jesus raised himself from the dead, the Father raised him from the dead, and the Holy Spirit raised him from the dead. The triune God is in all the creation of God and the triune God has taken place or has, has procured our salvation in Jesus Christ. Became dead and has come to life forever. Says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty. You are rich. And the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews. Who's that talking about? The Jews. <laughs> the Jews are blaspheming the Christians. Period. Yep. That happened. During the first part of the church age, the Jews heavily persecuted the Christians, didn't they? They crucified the king of Israel. Who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan... Do you ever read that in synagogues, Brother Roger? We're the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> well, that's what John says. <laughs> this, when you go into the synagogue, oh, this is Satan's synagogue. Yeah, all right. Verse number 10, do not fear about what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison. How is he doing this? By religious persecution, the devil works through religious persecution. In the Garden of Eden, we have the first religious persecution there where we have Cain and Abel. Cain was a leader. Cain was going to be the uh, patriarch of the family. Did you know that? Cain was going to be the leader. He was the firstborn. He was going to, he, he is the, was going to be the paterfamilia. He was going to be the father of the family when Adam died. But he goofed up, didn't he? He wouldn't accept to do things. He wouldn't, didn't want to do things God's way. And so his brother, which was not the heir at all, which was Abel. What does Abel mean? What does Abel mean in Hebrew? Huh? No, Abel. Abel. Abel means brief, just a vapor. Like, you know, when you go out in the, in the wintertime and your breath goes out, that's a vapor, and it is, you can see it at first, and then it just disappears. That's what Abel means, just a breath. Okay? Just something temporary. A cane means what? Ask for, I have begotten. Gotten. Gotten. Cain means gotten. We have gotten, and Eve said in, in Genesis 4 and 1, she said, I have gotten Jehovah. They thought he was the Messiah. Okay? But he wasn't. He was a false messiah. He's a type of the false messiah. All right? And he was a, is a type of church persecution from that time on. He said, uh, you may be tested. You'll be cast into prison. You may be tested. You will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Even though you're crowned with death in this life, I'm going to give you the crown of eternal life. Even though they kill you, you're not dead. All right? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now let's look about this period of time. It was about 251 A.D. to 313. Okay? But the ten periods of persecution actually start in the time of Ephesus. All right? The periods of persecution would actually start at 64 A.D. Through 313 A.D. That's the ten periods of Roman persecution. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. And then when we look at the, the Caesars, if we've got time, we're going to go back and find out what was taking place in church history. What were the doctrinal issues at that time? What was changing during that period of time so we can understand that? Now, who was the first uh, Roman Caesar? The real Julian line, Julius Caesar, you know. Which was the last of the Julian line? What was his name? 
Who knows? Nero. 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 All right, Nero. Nero was born in December the 15th, 37 A.D. All right? And uh, <clears throat> let's look at him. During his reign is when Peter and Paul were killed. Do you know that? During his reign was when Peter and Paul were murdered. Martyred. All right? During that reign, that period of time, he uh, began the first persecution. Now, the first five years of Nero's reign, that's the epitome of the Roman Empire. The epitome. Did you know that? He was a real Republican in order. He lowered all the taxes. He did. Everybody was happy. All the big businesses were happy. Everybody was just shouting, look what a great guy we got here. Look, look. And they were just thrilled by Nero to begin with. But once he got their confidence, that's what became. Once he got their confidence, he cut their throats. All right? Acts 25. And, uh, and, and through that period, 11 and 12, when Paul was a Roman citizen, was he not? Paul was a Roman citizen? Okay. When Paul, when they arrested him illegally, he said, I appeal to who? To Caesar. You know who he appealed to? Nero. We know what happened, don't we? Let's go back and look at it. Nero was the last uh, Roman emperor. He reigned between 54 and 68 A.D., by the way. He started ruling when he was 17 years old. His mother, uh, Agrippina, would do... She wanted him on the throne. Okay? She wanted him on the throne. He was adopted by one of the Caesars, which she married. All right? And he, uh, he was adopted by Caesar. And uh, she wanted to get him on the throne. He was the man that she wanted to get on the throne. <clears throat> Claudius married Julia and adopted her son Nero. And he gave his own, Oct his own daughter Octavia to him as a wife so that he would be in the line to rule, okay? Now his mother was called uh, Julia Agrippina. That was his mother's name. When Nero finally got on the throne, he killed Octavia. He had another wife that he loved very much, Papaya. he killed her by accident. He murdered his mother. He murdered his brothers. He murdered his family. He murdered everybody. He was a murderer. He was a uh, poet and he liked to play the not liar. Okay, he liked, he, he thought he was a great musician and a great poet and a great singer and he would go out and perform. Okay? But he, his morals were horrible. When he killed uh, Papaya, he killed her by going into a mad, manic episode, and she was pregnant with his child, and he kicked her in the stomach, and she aborted, and she died. But he loved her. And he had a servant that was a boy, and the boy favored her very much, and he had the boy neutered, and he used him as his wife. He painted him up just like his wife because he looked like her a little bit, and that's who he used for his wife. And he would, they would go out in the evening, at, starting at dusk, they would rape and pillar, pillage all through Rome and go into people's homes and steal everything that they had. This was the guy that lowered all the taxes. Okay? This is the guy that got their confidence. And then he cut the throats. The, uh, he had uh, two great men that, that helped him in the beginning. Uh, Annius Seneca and a uh, Afranius Butterus, all right? He finally ended up killing them too. <laughs> Everybody. The, uh, he wanted to rebuild Rome. There were 14 districts in Rome. And he wanted to rebuild Rome, but there was a whole lot of it was like ghettos and things or, 
less beautiful homes, and they had crooked streets. How many of you ever been in Cowtown? You know where I'm talking about? Fort Worth, Texas. The streets just go like this. You know what I'm talking about. Am I telling the truth? <laughs> you'll start off going one way, and you'll be on the same street going the opposite direction. And you don't know how in the world you ever, even did it. Well, that's the way Rome was. It was all twisted up, a bunch of cow trails, so to speak. Well, uh, he paid somebody to go out and start fire in the ghettos. It burned for six days. There were 14 districts in Rome, and almost all of seven of them were destroyed. Many beautiful works of art, and thousands and thousands of lives were killed. And he got up on a hill, and he played the, uh, a, uh, the Ilium of, the, the ruin of Ilium. He played and sang on his lyre as Rome burned for six days and people's lives. He didn't think anything about it at all, about all the lives and all of the fortunes that were lost because he was going to build a city that was going to call Nerodium. He's going to rebuild Rome, Okay. After all of this happened and everybody was in an uproar, nobody liked Nero much. The Romans didn't like Nero anymore. He'd come in, he got their confidence, and cut the throats. Then he says, he, he, uh, he paid some false witnesses to say that the Christians did it. So then we have the first persecution of Christians starting in 64 A.D. in Nero's time. Finally, Nero was completely, uh, the Rome has said, forget him, he's not our emperor anymore. In, uh, in June of 68 AD, he took his own life because they were going to execute him as a common criminal, as a common criminal. What was Rome's execution? What was their, what? Crucifixion. 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 So he killed himself. All right. Then we have Domitian. Domitian. Now, Domitian was born in October the 24th, 51 A.D., and uh, he uh, was a Roman emperor. He was the son of Vespasian and his, the younger brother of Titus Caesar. Okay, the younger brother of Titus Caesar. He was born, of course, I said, on October A.D., 51. He reigned from 81 to 96 A.D. In spite of all of his private immorality, he was trying to push morality and get, it, get the whole nation of Rome back to some, some uh, he was no reformer, to some moral structure and religion. Domitian was the first Roman emperor that said that he was the Lord God. He was the first Roman emperor that said, I'm God. Okay. Now, we know that sometime back in the period of time that they were actually worshiping the, the Caesar, Okay, they would look to him and they would reverence him, but Domitian was the first one that said, I am God. I am the Lord God. So this is the first one that was actually deified. <coughs> All right? He, uh, he organized a series of bloodthirsty proscriptions against the wealthy and the noble families. And then a conspiracy in which his wife was involved was formed against him, and he was murdered in September the 18th, 18th or uh, 96 A.D. Now, during his, this period of time is when John was exiled, wasn't it? When John was exiled to, to the island of Patmos, that's where he got the book of Revelation during this period of time. Hope I'm not boring you with all this stuff. All right. The acts in Domitian's first part of his, of his reign, he reversed the acts of Nero except where it talked about the persecution of the Christians. So Christians are are being persecuted pretty, pretty hard at this time. History says that the uh, great Babylon was drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. 
During this period of time, though, we find out that they were still... Pro- what does Romans, the 13th chapter, Paul wrote that? Now, Paul's already been killed, all right, in, in Nero's period of time. But, but what, does, what does Paul say for us to do in Romans, the 13th chapter? You remember? Submit to the governments and pray for your leaders. And so they were doing this. And at the very last part of his ministry... Or his they, persecution was slacked off just a little bit. Then we have Trajan. Trajan. Number three. The third period of persecution is Trajan. From 98 to 117 A.D. 98 to 117. He was born September the 18th, 53 A.D. And died August the 7th, 117 A.D. He was born in, in Spain. Uh, what kind of descendant was uh, Pontius Pilate? How many of you know what he was? Pontius Pilate. What was he? No, what descend? What nationality was he? What well, Romans? Italian. What was he? What was he? Trajan was Spanish. Pontius Pilate was Spanish. How many of you knew that? Pontius Pilate, Spanish. They were some of the the great warriors of the day, by the way. They said that the Spanish had no fear. They were the greatest warriors at that time, okay? So he's trading from this family. He's from an old Roman family, but he was born in Italica, Spain, all right? He was probably the ablest of the Roman rulers, they said. He began... uh, a period of uh, chival- chivalry and kindness to people. All right. He also, how many of you have seen the Roman walls that go into England and Ireland and all that? Have you ever seen the Roman walls over there in some of the history programs? And that? He extended the Roman Empire into all of these areas. He's the one that extended Roman Empire for a, 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 all over. And wherever he went into these areas, he persecuted Christians. All right. Art and learning flourished during Trajan's time. Art and learning. Education. Poetry. Philosophy. All right. It was going on at this time. He, uh, he did not chase Christians down. I want you to understand that until the last of his until the last of his reign he did not chase Christians down. He did not go try to find out where they were. Okay? He didn't try to do that at that time. There were bounty hunters later for Christians. But there were no bounty hunters for Christians during Trajan's time. It gets worse. Trajan said, if you find a Christian and you find out that he's a Christian, if he is a Roman citizen and if he is a ruler in the Senate or anything else, he can denounce his Christianity and he can stay in his office. If he won't denounce his Christianity, kill him. And he has to go and offer incense. Now this is during Trajan's time, okay? During this period of time. The most distinguished martyrs under Trajan were Polycarp, how many of you have heard of Polycarp? Huh? Who was Polycarp? Polycarp was one of John's disciples. John the Apostle's disciples. He was a great man of God. He was a pastor. He would go preach. He was an evangelist. And Polycarp was very old. And they captured Polycarp and they tortured Polycarp. And they tried to get him. I mean, he was like 100 years old. And all of the people that arrested him and everything didn't want to hurt him because he was such a wonderfully kind man. And they tried to get him to denounce his Christianity so he could go back home. They said, no. He said, the Lord God of heaven gave his son for me. How can I refuse to give my life for him? 
And they took him out and they tied him in a public square and they kept asking him, will you repent? Will you recant your religion? He just kept saying, no, no, no. And then he began to sing Christian hymns and gospel songs as he was tied up there and they were putting wood all around him. How many of you know about this story? And so they lit the fires. And all the time the fires were burning, this is history now. Polycarp was singing praises to God. And the fires, just like a flume or something around him, God put a, a barrier to where the flames would not hurt him. He didn't even have any heat. The people that went in there, uh, the, the, so the, the emperor, the, the magistrate said, go in there and kill him, stab him. And several times they sent people in there to stab him that the heat from the flames killed them. But Polycarp was still singing. Finally, after the flames laid down, they got in there and they stabbed and killed Polycarp. Okay. Now, Ignatius, the pastor of Antioch, was killed during this period of time. And Simon, the, the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, was killed during this time. So we know what happened here. There's some pretty heavy persecution during this time. And then we have Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius. He was born April the 26th, 121 A.D., and he died March the 17th, 180. And he was emperor between 161 and 180. He was born in Rome, by the way. He was Roman. His father died while Marcus was yet a boy and was adopted by his grandfather, Annius Veterus. And uh, <clears throat> from the earliest days, he enjoyed the friendship and patronage uh, patronage of the Emperor Hadrian and he bestowed upon him the honor of the equestrian order. What's the equestrian order? Cavalry. He was in the cavalry. He was over the horses, over the horse soldiers. Okay. When he was only six years old, he was made a member of the Salaean priesthood at eight and compelled Antius Paeus immediately after his own adoption to adopt as sons, heirs, both the Marcus and Coenus Commodus, later known as Emperor Lucius Verus. In honor of his adopted father, he changed his name from uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius to Marcus Julius as the Emperor Lucius and Verus. All right. Aurelius Verus to M. Aurelius Atonius. By the will of, the, of Hadrian, he espoused Faustina, the daughter of Antiochus, and he was raised to uh, countship in 180. Or 140 and received his tribunal power in 147. He co reigned with Lucius Verus between 161 and 169. And after 169, he, was, uh, he reigned alone until his death in 180. He was a great philosopher, and this guy was extremely superstitious. Very superstitious. And when you have people that are superstitious, what do you have? People that are afraid of their own shadow. So he always thought somebody was sneaking and creeping up on him, all right? And this is when we have the first bounty hunters after Christians, all right? This guy puts out bounty on Christian's head. Now, who is this? What is his name? Marcus Aurelius. So he begins to hunt out and to seek out Christians. And if anybody can prove the guilt of of them being a Christian, they get a reward. All right? They get a reward. So we have the first bounty hunters. Now let's go on a little bit further. During his reign, the absolute, uh, the blood of the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ flowed like water. Then number five, we have uh, Septimus Severus. He was born April 11th, 146. And he died uh, February the 4th to 11 A.D. Now, this is all during this period of time now that we're talking about in the Smyrna. Smyrna means what? Smyrna means what? Suffering. Persecution. All right? Septimus Severus. He was the uh, founder of the African dynasty of Roman emperors. All right? He died in York, England, February the 4th, 2011. 
He, in his period of time, made an edict that forbade anybody to convert to Judaism or to Christianity. And persecution raged, especially in Syria and in Africa. Now, these were where a lot of churches were being built, weren't they, during this period of time? Syria and Africa. Now we have come to six. Caius, Julius, Verus, Maximus of uh, the Thracian. He reigned from 235 to 238. He was a barbarian. He was evil in his persecution to Christians. That number six. Number seven, Decius. When Decius became Caesar, and he was the emperor between 249 and 251, he wanted to bring to extinction Christianity. He was going to completely destroy Christianity in the Roman Empire. He was going to completely destroy. Now, during this period of time is when the novations began, which were called Baptists during this period of time. During this period of time, also people in the churches began to apostatize. What does that mean? The churches began. So we had persecution from without, and now we're going to have apostasy from within. And this is the period of time when Novation and Cornelius, pastors in Rome, were fighting over accepting people that have come back. Now, many of these people in the churches would go out to the public square and offer sacrifices to the Roman gods. And they get off, and then they to go back to church. And Novation says, no way. Because not only would they offer sacrifices to the Roman gods, but they had a name and they had a letter saying that they had done this and they could live. And then they would go and they say, now, wait a minute, since you live, who were the members in that church that you were part of? Tell us the names of the members. And a lot of those were taken out and they would not denounce their faith, so they would kill them. And they'd want to come back, and this is where we have the Novation of Cornelius controversy, which we're going to talk about a little bit later on. Number eight, Valerian, 253 to 268. During Valerian's time, if you were a pastor or an elder or a deacon in any church, you were to be killed. That's it. You, you were not even asked to recant your faith or make an offering, you were a dead man if you were a pastor. All right? This is during the period of times when the catacombs, have you heard of the catacombs? This is the catacomb period of time right here in Valerians, from 253 to 260 A.D. And then we have Aurelian. And he was uh, born uh, September the 9th, 214, and he died 275 A.D. In his early part of his reign, he was tolerant to Christians, a little breather. And when, when the church, when persecution lacks up on the church, guess what the church does? It starts becoming liberal and it starts becoming apost apostate. Okay, so that's what we have during this period of time. In 272, when he gained possession of Antioch after defeating Senebia in several battles, <clears throat> he was appealed to by the Christians to decide whether the church building in Antioch, now this is in his early period of time, there was some leniency. Which one was supposed to be the pastor of this church? And then later on, he turns around and he begins to persecute them. As soon as he got in control, then he began to persecute heavy. And the edict of Galenius commenced during his period of time. And then we have number 10, Diocletian. Diocletian was a Roman emperor, persecuted the church and became, uh, uh, he was born of parents who had been slaves. 245 to 313 A.D. He split his authority under different people. And even though he was more tolerant to the Christians, his soldiers and his generals, some of them were not. And the edicts that were carried out during that period of time uh, was zero tolerance. 
He was the one that began to burn all of the Holy Scriptures, the Bibles. And he began to, to burn all of the pastors and deacons at the stake. And he began with them, he, with every church that he would conquer, he would tear every church building down to the foundations if they had a church building. Of course, you remember there were a lot of, uh, of house churches, remember, during that time. That's all churches originally were house churches. Now, right after this period of time, now we're going to have the Roman Empire marry the state. The Roman Empire marries the state. And that's under who? Constantine. Now let's go in the very next letter. Verse number 12 in the second chapter. And the angel of the church of Pergamos write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. By the word, the two-edged sword, how many of you know what that really means, two-edged sword? How many of you know what a double-edged knife looks like? Hmm? That's a, that's a knife blade that has sharp on both sides. It's usually used for killing. It's a stiletto. Yeah. It's a double-bladed. And in Greek, it means a double mouth. In other words, it cuts on both sides. It chews on both sides. You, you go like this and you go like that, and it'll cut on both sides. It's a double-edged blade. Okay. Now it says here, <clears throat> Pergamum, by the way, means what? Two times married. All right. The one who has a tarp, sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell and where th Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwelt. Verse number 14, And I have a few things against you because you have, <clears throat> there are some among the hold of teaching of Balaam. What's Balaam? Teaching of Balaam. False God. Huh? False God, the devil. Balaam preached for money. He preached for wages. He was a... Uh, Balaam was the, son, was the father of, the, of Janus and Jambres when Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh, and that rascal lived a long time. You know, the devil takes care of his own. Well, that, the devil gave that man a long, long life. He was a plague to Israel for a long time. The teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. Thus, you also have some in the same way that hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. What does the Nicolaitans mean? During this period of time now, what period of time was this? 313 to 606 A.D. And we're going to look and see what happened in church history during that period of time. <clears throat> Repent, therefore, or else I am coming uh, to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. To him who overcome him, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone. White stone means what? He's innocent. When, the, when the, they voted in, in juries, they either had a black stone and a white stone. And they gave all the stones. They didn't say who they were. They just dropped these stones in a box. And they went up to the judge. And the judge, white, innocent, black, guilty. White, innocent. I'll give him a, 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 a sign of innocence. And I will give him a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. Now Pergamos. All right, Pergamos is 313 to 606 A.D. Now get your little charts out. Let's go and see what's happening in church history. Let's see what the Apostle Paul, uh, how he dealt with these churches in the early periods of time and how he laid down issues in 1st and 2nd Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, and all of these letters. They were having church problems. Well, these church problems kept existing in the churches. Now let's see what in the world happened. All right? Well, we covered Ephesus and we covered Smyrna. And Smyrna, it talked about the ten periods of persecution of the Roman Empire. And I covered it better today than I think I ever took time to do before. I'm trying to do everything better. <laughs> we have in the 
we have the Lord's churches. All Baptist, all churches were Baptist at 100 A.D. Did you know that? They were all Baptist churches. In 200 A.D., they were all Baptist churches. In 250 A.D., they were still all Baptist churches, but heresy began to creep in to those churches. Let's, let's see what some of the heresies were. We have uh, some great writers in history, what they call the, uh, the Antonician Fathers. That's before the Council of Nice, all right? And the Council of Nice was the one that was called by Constantine the Great. And that's where they sat down and they figured out what books were in the Bible and all that kind of stuff, okay? Well, <clears throat> before this period of time, we have people, especially in Alexandria, Egypt, that was what we call the liberal school of theology over there in Alexandria, Egypt. And uh, this is, by the way, where uh, Augustine was and many of these early writers. And one of the first things that they did when they married the church to the state was what? When Constantine married the church to the state. Before that, the church had been heavily persecuted, hadn't it? But when Augustine, or, but Constantine came on the throne... Remember when he's supposed to have that battle with his brother? And, he's, and he had this vision in the sky, and he saw a, a vision from God, and he said, by this, by this cross, you conquer. Okay? So he adopted Christianity. And he won the battle. And that he says, I think that I will make Christianity the church of the state. So he married the church to the state. Now, Baptists through all the ages have always believed in separation of church and state. You can't regulate Christianity, can you? You can't regulate it. You can't regulate morality. All right? That's history. Okay? It's history. Well, so the Baptists, when Constantine came up, they said, we don't want to have any part of what you're doing. We don't regulate Christianity. We don't go out and make converts by the sword. How, do, how, does, how did the Catholic Church make converts during the Dark Ages? They went conquering on the Christian crusades. The word Christian crusades is not Christian. It was crusades, all right. The Inquisition. The Inquisition, you, you took people that didn't believe like you did and they would take them, and you know what the Inquisition, you know what the Inquisition means? Brother Mike, you know what that means? I suggest that we inquire if you believe. You examine. You're examined. You're asked. How did they examine you? They took your hand and put it in boiling water. You, are you a Christian? No! You know, they, they branded you. They tore your fingernails off. This is what they did. That's how they examined you. Okay? Tortured. That was during this period of time. After the church in 313 A.D. we have, Const we have Constantine the Great. 325 actually. And then he began the persecution persecuting other Christians. He began to persecute other people. And you know who those other Christians were? Baptists. These were the Baptists that he began to persecute because the Baptists stood away from what would become Catholicism at that time. And one of the first things they wanted to do is, uh, is they wanted everybody to be a member of the state and the church. Everybody had to be a member of the state and the church. How do you get into the church? How do you, get, how do you become a church member? What's the first re prerequisite before you can become a church member? What is it? Yes. Baptism. Baptism. So they said, aha, we'll just baptize everybody. They'll have so many days to baptize their children when they're born. And then they said, well, children can't believe because you had to believe, make a confession of faith before you were baptized. Even these early Catholics knew that. So what did they invent at this period of time? Godmothers and godfathers. The godmother and godfather would stand up there and they'd make a profession of faith for the child, for the infant, and they say, we will have the, ch the infant change. And this is where we have the word Catholic. The word Catholic begins right here at this period of time. 
What does Catholic mean? What's Catholic mean? Universal. Universal. One church, Catholic church. This is when the idea of the universal church began right here because they were all members of this one state universal church that went through all. So the first thing you could do is you're going to get all the adherents, all of the citizens of the Holy Roman em the Holy Roman Empire. They're going to baptize all the babies so that they will become members of the state and the church. And that's how it began. All right. And then what was the next thing they did? By 500 A.D., infant baptism had been established by law. In 600 A.D., they have the first pope elected. The first pope takes place during this time. That's the Nicolaitan business. That's when all of the archbishops and the bishops, that's when they begin to look up to the pastors instead of the pastors being the servants during this period of time. Do you have any questions? What year was that? That was in 600, 606, I think it was, when the first pope was actually elected. During this period of time, we have uh, Mariolatry started. What's Mariolatry? Not like it is worship, not like it's practiced today. What is Mariolatry? That's where they began. Mary began to be an intercessor between man and God. You had to go to Mary first. Yes. Isn't it true when Constantine uh, realized Christianity, he brought his pagan beliefs? Yes, he did. And we're going to see. These yes. That's right. All of this was brought into the church at that period of time. Thank you very much for that. But Mariolatry was started, which there's only one intercessor between God and man, and that's who? Jesus Christ. Mariolatry was begun, and they began to worship Mary during this period of time in the 500s. Now, as we go on down, we're going to see Mariolatry expanded. Up until the 20th century, they were still expanding Mariolatry. And we'll get to that as we go. Do you have any other questions before I turn you loose? I went over just a little bit. but uh, And I hope you didn't get too bored to death, death by the Caesars and everything else. But it's very important that you know what was happening during these period of time. Yes? Uh, Okay, that is on down. The indulgences were a little past 600, and purgatory is about 700. That's next week's. <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to get there next week. We're going to the invention of purgatory and the invention of indulgences. Indulgences, they made a lot of money on that. Do you have any other questions? Do you have any other, anything else? Anything else? All right. Thank you for your good for your attention and the endurance of those hard seats. Go out and do something, Colonel. Visitation Tuesday night for those that want to go. Good food. Nothing else. That's a good reason to go. Not to mention that you get souls saved.